I'm going to transition and we're going to talk about the American soldier in World War I, what he would have dealt with, how he had to train, what equipment he used, weaponry, um, and then we'll transfer into Q&A. So I don't know everything, but I will try and answer what I know according to what you're interested in. And so that's kind of how we'll do it in, in three parts. Uh, just one bit of clarification before we begin. Everything you're going to see, unless I tell you otherwise, is original. So I have a couple reproductions here. I'll explain why I need them to be reproduction. Uh, the biggest pe two pieces will be the shoes, uh, because period shoes, most of them rotted away. And what ones do exist are worth way too much money to try and put on my feet. Uh, and the second is the gas mask, because those also rot. And the last thing I need to do is give a presentation about a gas mask inhale in, breathe in whatever was actually in there, and die in front of you. So I'm not going to do that, so that's also reproduction, but I'll point that out. Other than that, you'll be looking at original material, uh, just as it would have been, that's what you'll see. So let's start by talking about uh, the beginnings of World War I and America's entry into the war. Well, the years leading up to 1917, uh, when the U.S. joined the war, were a transformative period for the nation. And in many ways, that is when the United States began to become a great power. By 1910, the United States had already become the world's leading industrial power, and by the war, you have numbers like this. The U.S. possessed 35.5% of the world's manufacturing capacity, compared to 16% for Germany and only 15% for Britain. America's industry and finance would be vital to the war even before we entered it. And still, though, most of America's population was rural. Also, a large percentage of the population were either immigrants or first-generation children of immigrants, and they came from all over the world. The largest number of immigrants in the United States before the war were from the British Isles, including Ireland. But Germans were the second largest number of immigrants. So opinions about the war were pretty evenly split. In all, there were 15 million European immigrants in the U.S., with a million new immigrants arriving in the country every single year. Now, on August 19, 1914, President Woodrow Wilson, the 28th President of the United States, gave a speech officially declaring the United States neutral. But Americans eagerly and actively contributed aid and supplies. And within a year of his speech, there were over 100 institutions giving some form of humanitarian aid. An example of that would be the Belgian Relief Organization, which, independent of any government assistance, contributed six million tons of food to Belgian civilians before we ever entered the war. But who did America support? And how did American neutrality transform itself into a declaration of war just a few years later? Well, imagine with me, many immigrant communities had their own newspapers and their own organizations and used their own languages. And there was support for both sides and certainly more for the central powers than you would think. The German community obviously supported the central powers, but the Jewish community did as well, since Austria-Hungary was pretty much the most tolerant country in Europe and Russia was hated for its anti-Jewish pogroms. The Irish, to a large extent, also supported the Germans because they hate the British. However, there was also an Anglophile elite and crossed bloodlines among them. For example, Woodrow Wilson's mother was British and Winston Churchill's was American. So you can tell there was quite conflicting ideas all the way around. On top of that, the U.S. had historically stayed out of foreign entanglements. And the only war with a European power since independence had been the Spanish-American War of 1898, which had not been very widespread supported by the population. And anyhow, the U.S. in 1914 only had an army of 130,000 regulars and 70,000 state guard members. General Peyton March, Army Chief of Staff, pointed out that these numbers were barely enough to police a domestic emergency. But America's role in the early stages of the war was immediate and not surprising, it was economic. Because America realized one thing, selling munitions makes you money. So sheesh, by October 1914, the British had already ordered 400,000 rifles. Munitions and war material exports would rise from only $14 million in 1914 to $1.29 billion in just two years. 
To put that in perspective, in today's dollars, before the war, we sold only $343 million in military munitions overseas. Within two years of the war breaking out, we were selling $31.6 billion worth of material. We know how to turn a profit. And the U.S. also became the Allies' banker. And though neutral, we would lend $2 billion to the Allies and only $27 million to the Central Powers. One U.S. congressman described America as, quote, the arch-hypocrite among nations, praying for peace, while furnishing the instruments of murder to one side only, end quote. But why was that, since initially there was a great deal of German support? Why choose to ally with Britain, France, and Russia? Well, there were several reasons. There was the constitutional and language similarities, of course, but one of the biggest and most underappreciated reasons is that Germany's transatlantic communication cable was cut by the British. So American reporters had to route every single story through Britain. And anything that was not favorable to British interests was censored by the British government. Parliament had passed the Defense of the Realm Act, which gave censors power to scrutinize every single word that went from Britain to America, meaning German atrocities were hyped and expanded, such as the rape of Belgium and the execution of Edith Cavell and the giants of yellow journalism Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst would make their field day in exaggerating German atrocities and not really saying anything at all about British or French problems. <laughs> so the central powers obviously could not keep up from a PR standpoint. Anything they did was probably not heard of here in the United States. And if those things were big deals, imagine how big the sinking of the liners Lusitania and Arabic by German submarines were to the American public with the loss of American civilian lives. In fact, the only media at that time that spoke out against the war and wished to keep America out of it was the socialist press and the German press. And their reach was really quite limited, even though there were over 500 German language newspapers in the States but their combined circulation was under 2 million at a time where the population was 102 million. Now, to look at the slide of war, there's no one you can look at more clearly and succinctly than President Woodrow Wilson and how his views changed from 1914 to 1917. Now, as President, Wilson was also Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, and though it fell to Congress to declare war, Congress was in session for only three months between the outbreak of the war on July 28, 1914 and the end of 1915. That's right, three months. The Congress elected in November of 1914 didn't even convene until December of 1915. And you thought our Congress was lazy. So Wilson had to act on his own. And he was, by his own admission, new to foreign policy. He said this when he was elected in 1912, quote, It would be an irony of fate if my administration had to deal with foreign problems, for my preparation has been in domestic matters, end quote. His concerns were more moral than strategic, and initially he saw himself as a mediator only, and even in December of 1914, he emphasized that the U.S. had never had, and never would, have a standing army. Former President Teddy Roosevelt blasted Wilson for abject cowardice and said that Wilson was willing to sacrifice the honor and interests of the country for his own political advancement. A young Franklin Delano Roosevelt even wrote a book promoting American intervention and said the U.S. ran the risk of becoming another Belgium. But the campaign of unrestricted submarine warfare that resulted in the sinking of the Lusitania and the Arabic and Wilson's friend and personal advisor, Edward House, a big influence on Wilson, who always was urging him to support Britain, and the new Secretary of State, Robert Lansing, who did the same, began to really change Wilson's mind about military intervention. In his December of 1915 State of the Union address, Wilson presented plans for building up the armed forces, and in May of 1916, Congress passed the National Defense Act which doubled the size of the army and nationalized the state guard units into what we now know as the National Guard. He also passed the Naval Appropriations Act, which aimed to create a world-class navy 
for the first time in American history. In early 1916, he kicked off his presidential preparedness campaign with a series of speeches saying that the U.S. might well be drawn into the conflict and must prepare for it. And like it or not, and he didn't, the presidential election of 1916 would have the war as its central issue. Wilson would win a narrow victory by winning several swing states on razor-thin margins using the slogans, He Kept Us Out of War, and America First. He even lost his home state of New Jersey, which wouldn't be repeated again in a presidential election until exactly 100 years later when Donald Trump failed to carry New York on an America First platform. The centennial similarities are ironic, if nothing else. In 1917, the Germans again began a campaign of unrestricted submarine warfare, and American citizens began to die as a result. And when the Russian Revolution toppled the Tsar, one of the major contradictions that the Allies were fighting for democracy was removed. But as late as March 19th, Wilson still felt like this about going to war. Quote, It would mean we would lose our heads and stop weighing right and wrong. Once you lead people into this war, they will forget there ever was such a thing as tolerance. To fight you must be brutal and ruthless, and the spirit of ruthless brutality will enter into the very fiber of our national life. If there is any alternative, for God's sake, let's take it. Less than a month after he said that, Woodrow Wilson asked Congress for a declaration of war against Germany, which would come on April 6, 1917. Now that's a very general overview of our entering into the First World War, and I would recommend you look up the specifics for yourself to understand the complexities that were at play. But I want to transition from this into the great call-up of 1916 to say something about the state of the American army by reading this quote from the First World War by author John Keegan. Quote, It is true that great forces of geopolitics, strategy, culture, and economics shaped the context in which Wilson made his decision. It is true that the opinions of others counted in his decision. Wilson's decision to intervene was a close, risky thing, a calculation of costs and benefits and a reflection of the human condition that could easily have taken him in a different direction. But in the end, his decision was the crucial factor. He, and he alone, took the United States into World War I. Now, when you talk about the army at the time that Woodrow Wilson asked for a declaration of war, nothing better could explain the state of the American military than the great call-up of 1916. In June of 1916, there had been a real possibility of war between the United States and Mexico, thanks to something known as the Zimmerman Telegram, where the Central Powers had offered Mexico that they could take basically most of Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico, and Southern California for themselves, if they would declare war on the United States. Again, all transmissions to the United States or overseas having to go through British telegraph cables, the British were only too happy to reveal that telegram. And the U.S. Army had put together around 12,000 troops for its cross-border campaign to protect the United States. But they need a lot more to show how serious the United States was about protecting its border. So they mobilized the entire National Guard. There was a plan for orderly mobilization, but basically rushing as many guardsmen to the border as possible was the order of the day. By the end of July, there was 110,957 <clears throat> National Guardsmen at the border. And there was a lot of confusion and a lot of problems, and I'll just briefly mention some of them. Reluctance to serve was a huge problem, and the physical condition of the men the other. The Surgeon General said this about the National Guard at the time, quote, The large percentage of rejections at the muster in physical examination appears to the department's surgeon as the most disappointing feature of the mobilization, indicating that the enlistment examinations were nominal and superficial. In modern language, what he said was, the men were fat and lazy. And the Army's logistical system was overwhelmed. There weren't enough supplies for the guardsmen, and since there had been no prearranged plans for border mobilization, 100,000 inexperienced men suddenly showed up at the border and needed to be trained. The regular army was stripped of its officers to do so, and the red tape was colossal. 
And I love this quote about the staggering problems about requisition forms just to get basic equipment. Listen to this lieutenant, quote, there was not only a shortage of blank forms, but a shortage of the forms needed to requisition the blank forms, end quote. The National Guard blamed the Army for the shortages, and the Army blamed Congress. And let's not even get into the overload issues for the railways that had to move all the men and their equipment, and the economic issues at the border, where now 100,000 men show up and want to eat, have a good time, and hang out. Still by Christmas, 156,414 guardsmen have been transported from across this country to the Mexican border, even though three quarters of them had no training and they were led by officers with little to no actual experience. And reports like this one in the excellent book, The Great Call-Up, read like this, quote, Under most favorable conditions, the regiment might be made available for field service against an inferior enemy in six months. Against trained troops, it would require at least two years." End quote. So you can see why the Central Powers in 1917 were not especially worried about American intervention, if they could bring the war to a conclusion some point in early 1918. Thing is, America learned a lot about the Great Call-Up. The mobilization problems that were highlighted were on full display, such as the Army's reliance on animals instead of cars and trucks, then steps were made to correct the mess. So the period from June 1916 to March 1917 was one of intense training and troubleshooting. Why that's important here is that this really served as a dress rehearsal for the great American mobilization for World War I. The great call-up would transform the National Guard into a much more effective fighting force, and it was as close as the United States ever got to the large-scale military maneuvers that European armies traditionally engaged in all the time. And so thus, there you go, a fledgling army, a fledgling nation, and one man leading us to war, a war that had been going on for nearly four years by the time we would enter it. So what was the U.S. soldier to expect, and just what was the shape of the average soldier? Well, that's what we transition to now.